Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation, part of Agilent's Virtual Energy and Chemical Summit. I am Abby Pell of Lab Roots, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Now let's get started. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you would like during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We will answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. I now present today's speaker, Shannon Coleman, de demystifying valve chroma chromatography. For a complete biography on today's speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Shannon Coleman, you may now begin your presentation. And thank you all for coming. Uh, welcome. Um, I'm happy you could make it to my event today. Uh, my name is Shannon Coleman. I'm an application scientist here at Agilent Technologies, and I'm here today to talk to you about uh, GC rotary valve modes of operation and application. So you can see here I have a um, 7890B GC. Hold on a second. And uh, up here, down here on the on the front panel, you can see a plumbing diagram. When a lot of times when I go into customers. Uh, labs, I'll see a GC setting on the on the bench, and it'll have a large valve oven on it. And when I see a valve oven on a GC, I immediately ask the customer, so where's your plumbing diagram? Let me take a look at that diagram. Because that diagram is going to tell me a couple of things. It's going to tell me um, how the GC is configured and, and how the GC is intended to operate. So today in this presentation, uh, hopefully I can give you the groundwork uh, to where you'll understand how to read these diagrams, you'll understand the basic mechanics of how valves work, and you'll also have the knowledge to uh, troubleshoot uh, some of the valve applications that you might be working with. Um, and also, if you have any new applications that you're considering for matrices that are complex, that may be more complex than just simple inlet to detector, um, then valve GC might be necessary. And hopefully I can give you the tools about how to start to think about uh, those applications. So let's get started. I'm going to walk back over here to my computer, and um, we'll get started with the presentation. So let's get started just with some basics of understanding valves. You can see here we have a uh, plumbing diagram. And at first glance, it's quite complicated. Um, um, I was talking to one customer one time, and they said, you know, Shannon, this just looks like a big plate of spaghetti to me. How am I supposed to understand uh, what's going on with all of these lines crossing and intersecting and that sort of thing? And I realized at that point that, you know, if it's not something you've been looking at a lot, um, it can seem quite daunting and uh, intimidating. So. Hopefully today we can give you some tools to eliminate some of the trepidation that comes along with, with understanding how to look at uh, complex valve systems. So how are valves used in chromatography? It's really pretty simple. Um, there's really three primary functions of a, of a gas valve on a, on a GC. One would be to select a specific sample uh, for injection. So, there's such things as uh, multi-position stream select valves, where you could have multiple streams, gas phase streams coming into an instrument. Um, and you can use a valve to select one of those streams to deliver it to the instrument for analysis. Uh, the second mode of operation uh, is typically injection of a sample. And this is probably the most common thing you'll see. You'll see a, a gas sample valve uh, on the instrument for injecting a gas phase sample. And then the third primary function would be just to change the direction of flow of the gases in the instrument as they flow through the instrument from the injection point to the detectors. And that's really pretty much it. I mean, there's not a whole lot more to it than that. Now, the valves themselves get a little bit more complicated. You know, uh, the, the designs of how, we, how you plumb the valve can, can be co quite complicated sometimes. So that's what we're going to try to focus on here. But keep in mind that 
really the purpose of these valves is those three things, and that's what you'll run into the, that common theme throughout this, this presentation. So one of the things I want to talk to you about is, is just, you know, start very basic and start about, you know, how to read a, what do these valves mean on the diagram and, and what, how are the drawings laid out to show you what, how the valve is functioning. So if you look at a valve, here's a four-port rotary valve, here's a six-port rotary valve, and here's a ten-port. And we're, today we're going to focus mostly on six-port and ten-port valves, although there, there are other larger valves uh, than these. There's 14-port and 16-port valves. Uh, but for simplicity's sake, we're going to focus on these two valves here. Um, you can see on each one of the valves, you, we have a, uh, a dot on the valve. Here, this four-port valve has four points, and these are connection points. These are points where on the actual physical valve where we would attach a tube to allow gas to flow in or out of the valve. And then these points are connected by a line, and this line is, uh, designates a flow path as an enable between these two points. So you need to remember that if there's a line between two ports, that flow is enabled between those two ports. Ports three and four do not have flow enabled. Now, if we switch the valve to the on position, um, ports three and four would be enabled and port three and two would not be enabled. So it's important to note that when you look at one of these valves on paper, how do you know if the valve is either in the on or the off position? Well, you know because it's pretty much an industry-wide standard that when drawing valves, you draw them in their de-energized or their off position. And then whoever's reading the diagram can then have uh, some confidence that as they're looking at the diagram that they know that valve is in the off position. And you can see here I have a CAD drawing of an actual rotary valve, and you can tell by looking at this valve that there's no way to tell uh, what position the valve's in. Is it on or is it off? You don't know. Um, so. You can see here there's some ports, 16th inch ports on the valve. Um, each port has a number on the valve stamped on the valve. So you can see here ports one and six. This happens to be a six port valve. And you can see how this directly correlates with the drawing. So we know if this valve is installed on the instrument and we turn that valve off, then ports one and six will have flow um, enabled between them. So when the valve is in the off position, we know from the drawing that since the drawing uh, valves are drawn in the off position, when we turn this valve off, ports one and six have flow enabled between them. So that's the only way to really know, um, you know, what position that valve's in or where the flows are in the valve is, is through this convention on how we draw them and plumb them. If you look a little closer at the valve body, and you start to disassemble it, you can see there's three major parts um, to the valve body. You can see here we have a stainless steel valve body. We have our ports with our tubes coming in and out of it. Uh, this happens to be gas sample valve. You can see the gas sample loop going around and back into the valve here. You can see that inside of the valve is a rotor, and there, on top of the rotor screws down a preload assembly that provides tension on the rotor that provides gases from leaking out of the valve as it's uh, in use. If you take the preload assembly off and you look directly down on top of the valve, you can see the back end of the rotor. And then if you take the rotor out of the valve and you look directly down into the valve body, you can see that um, there's a key drive slot down inside of, of the valve body. If you look closer at the rotor, you can see that there's a rotor tab and this tab fits down inside of this keyed slot, which is an indentation in the bottom of the valve body. And that's how we use the valve driver or the, the valve actuator to turn this rotor into one position or another. If you look at the more closely at the valve rotor, you can see that the rotor is like the valve body, uh, made out of stainless steel. And then there's a, a rotor groove machined through this polymer coating on the valve here. Um, this rotor groove is, relates to that line that's drawn on the valve diagram. So the, the connection point between the two ports is made by this rotor groove that allows gas to flow from 
uh, the ports that have flow enabled to them. And you'll see there's a little gap here where there's this polymer that uh, separates these rotor grooves. This is a six port valve. It would have three rotor grooves uh, connecting the set of two, two ports each. So these ports uh, are protected by this uh, polymer material that's encased uh, on the valve. This prevents gases from leaking out of the valve, prevents this gas, atmospheric gases from leaking into the valve, and it prevents gases from leaking from port to port um, in the valve. Now, if you were to get a particle in here and you were to actuate this valve and the rotor was to spin, the particle could scar this material and you could create a small leak between these ports and then you would have uh, some issues with your chromatography because the valve wouldn't be working properly. And so at that point, you'd have to disassemble the valve, take the rotor out of the valve, and replace it. You can also see here on the rotor tab, there's a letter. Um, all of these rotors that you get, we use uh, mainly Valco valves here at Agilent, and all the Valco valves have an ID letter on the rotor. That rotor ID letter tells you what type of polymer material is uh, on the rotor, and really this is the limiting uh, component to the valve. The rest of the valve is made of stainless steel. It's very durable. It's, uh, it can withstand really high pressure, but this rotor material cannot. It has very specific properties. Uh, that are, are going to be specific of your application, and really you need to be mindful of them. So if you look at this letter E here um, and you reference the Valco uh, material, you can see here that Valcon E is a polyether ketone PSTFE composite, and it has a rating of 400 PSI at about 225 degrees C. So uh, this is what probably 90% or more of the instruments that are shipped from Agilent with valves on them will have this uh, Valcon E rotor um, in the valves because it's a pretty general purpose rating and uh, it works with most applications. Now, if you have some uh, other applications that are requiring higher pressures, there are some other options and these are just a few of them. There's, there's many more than this. But you can see the Valcon P is a PF, PTFE and carbon composite with a rating of 1,000 PSI, but it's at the cost of temperature. So if you go to a higher temperature, um, you would not be able to hold this, uh, this pressure rating. And T has a uh, 300 PSI rating at 330 uh, degrees C. So these are things you have to be mindful of. If you have special applications, then you might need to uh, consider other rotors and other than the Valcon E rotor. So you can see here that I've taken uh, kind of what we would normally see in the valve diagram and I've just overlaid it on, the, on a top-down view of a valve to kind of show you um, how these dots and lines relate to the valve itself. So you can see the connection ports here and you can see that if we take this you know, in your mind overlay these uh, connection ports with the dots on the diagram, you can see they directly relate to uh, the, where the rotor groove is uh, inside of the valve and also relative to the ports on the valve. So the diagram is a direct representation of the actual valve. So when you're looking at a GC, um, how do you know where, how the instrument's configured? How do you know where the valves are on the instrument? How do you know uh, what number the valve is configured. So if I want to switch a valve on the instrument, how do I know by looking at the diagram uh, what valve number relates to the, to the GC on the diagram? So if I want to switch, you know, this four-port valve here on this uh, diagram to the on position, um, how would I know which valve number uh, on the instrument to select? Well, all, all GCs that ship from Agilent that have valves on them will come with one of these diagrams uh, drawn by the factory. And that, the valves will be pre-configured on the instrument. And so you'll know by looking at the numbers here, you can see here, uh, if you look at this diagram, it's very much laid out um, like an Agilent GC. We have our flow source on the left here. And we have the left side of the oven, which is an unheated zone for valves. And then up on top of the instrument, we have the injection ports. Uh, two different possible injection ports here. 
these could be any type of uh, injector, multi-mode, coolant column, MMI, uh, PTV. And then we have our valve compartment, which usually sits on top of the instrument. And this happens to be a, a diagram for a small valve oven, which holds four valves. And you can see we have two valve heater blocks here, block one and two, and each one of these blocks holds two valves. And we have our detector zones off on the right-hand side of the instrument, which is generally where the detectors are mounted unless you're using mass spec, in which case they'd be mounted on the left-hand side of the instrument. So you have a uh, this four-port valve here. If you look above the valve, you see some numbers here. The first number on this diagram is the valve number, and that's the valve number on the diagram, so this is valve one, and it's the valve on the instrument. So when you go to the instrument, if you go to valves on the keypad and you select valve one and turn it on, you would be turning this four-port valve on. The other numbers that are on the diagram are some part numbers that are associated with the valve itself. So this happens to be an option 904 that you can order uh, on a 7890, so a 30. Uh, 3440 G3440B option 904 would put a four-port valve on a on a 7890 here. We have two 7890-0382s, which are these inert uh, capillary to valve interface bulkheads, and an 872, which is a non-inert uh, bulkhead fitting that allows you to attach a capillary column to this bulkhead fitting down into the GC oven. So it it, it brings a, a bulkhead down from the valve. Uh, down in the oven where you can make capillary connections to it. So you can see here these diagrams become important for not only you understanding um, how your instrument's configured if if you take on new responsibility and you inherit an, an instrument that's that's already got valves on it, you you can look at these diagrams and understand pretty quickly how the instrument's configured, what's on it, and how it should operate. Um, it also gives you the power to work with Agilent to design your own system. If you have some ideas for, oh, we want to put valves on this system to do a certain uh, chromatographic function, uh, then you can work with your, your local Agilent team uh, to get a valve diagram drawn in the factory who build that diagram to your specifications. Um, so. It's, it's, it's a great tool for not only troubleshooting and understanding, but for conveying information back and forth to Agilent. So I'll just pause right here before we move on, because we're kind of going into another phase here, talking about the functions of the valves uh, from an application standpoint. Are there any questions um, from that, uh, from the information I just gave you there? Hey, thanks, Shannon. All right, let's check and see. I'm just checking the Q&A box. And checking the chat. I don't see any there. Let's check the phone lines real quick. Cecilia? Star one for any questions. We'll pause for a moment. And no questions at this time. OK, back to you, Shannon. Uh, looks like maybe, was there a, a question from James Boone? Uh, Thomas sees a, a chat there. I think he's just making some comments. Oh, that, okay. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> All right. All right. We're good. Um, let's see. We have, let's move on and let's talk some more about valves here. Um, feel free to, to chat in if you have any comments. Um, we're going to start talking about six port valves. You can see here we have a, uh, a blank six port valve. And one of the things I want you to think about is when you, are thinking about valves, you don't necessarily have to think about them in terms of just a blank valve and, oh, all right, if I want a gas sample valve, where am I going to draw the lines in and, and the loops and that sort of thing uh, to order a gas sample valve from Agilent? You don't have to do that. So this is a blank six-port valve. And you can see here I have um, eight different six-port valves drawn here, okay? This is just a couple of the different valve configurations that you could do with six port valves. And you'll see here on these option numbers that these are all valves that Agilent will offer and pre-configure for you. So if you order a GC and you want a gas sample valve, you can just order the G3440B option 701 and that will install a gas sample valve 
already plumbed in a valve box on your instrument. You don't have to think about that. So you can think about uh, one of the things I want to uh, guide you on here is to not necessarily think about valves as just a blank valve trying to understand it. Kind of look at the bigger picture, step back, and look at the shape and the form of the valve design and think about those, try to learn what the functions of those particular designs are. And then you really don't have to think about trying to figure out exactly what's going on with the valve. So, for instance, when I look at this valve here, I don't have to look at this label here. I know this is a gas sample valve uh, just by looking at it. I don't have to trace the lines and make sure that the, the loop is in the right place and all of that. Um, so we're going to talk about a couple of these valves. We're going to talk about these three that I've highlighted here and walk through um, their form and function for you. And we're going to do the same thing for a few temport valves. And then we're going to take those valves and we're going to build up an application. And I'm going to kind of show you how to think about that. So here we have a six bore valve and it's a, it happens to be a gas sample valve as we were just talking about. And uh, we know it's a gas sample valve because when we look at it, we see that it's got a loop on it. So all gas sample valves are going to have a loop on it. It doesn't matter if they're, they're six port valves, they're 10 port valves, or they're 16 port valves. So it's a gas sample valve, you'll see a loop on it. So you'll know that that valve is injecting a sample. Um, the, the loop is a fixed volume loop. The, the option 701 uh, gas sample valve comes with a 250 uh, or a 0.25 milliliter loop. So a quarter of a mil uh, would be injected here. And so you can fill this loop by attaching um, either a pressurized gas sample container um, to this inlet here that goes into the loop, or you can attach a, a Tedlar bag or a syringe with a lure lock fitting on here, and you can push sample through the loop, and that's how you would load the loop. You can also connect it directly to a process. Um, there's a few things you have to be mindful about um, when, you're, when you're loading gas sample valves. And one is, is the, um, the sample volume that's inside of the loop is directly related to the pressure. So that the, the loop is a fixed loop. And so being a fixed loop, it happens to be uh, one of the most repeatable forms of injection, uh, depending on one thing, and that's if the pressure is the same all the time. So it's governed by the ideal gas law. So if you've taken some chemistry, you know PV equals NRT. So if the pressure changes in this loop, if the pressure goes up, then the number of moles in the loop go up, and we inject more sample. Then as if the pressure is low and the number of moles go down, we would inject less sample. And so it's important that we have the, vo the pressure on the loop the same every time we do an injection, all the way from our standards calibration uh, to our direct sampling. And so how you do that typically is you would allow sample to flow through the loop, which is going to require some amount of pressure. It's going to flow out the vent to atmosphere. Um, and then before you inject, you would stop the flow on the valve and allow the sample in the loop to equilibrate to atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure doesn't change enough uh, over the time frame, uh, you know, unless you're in a hurricane or something. Uh, that you would uh, see uh, loss of repeatability. And so it's important to adjust it to atmospheric pressure every time before you inject. And that's how you get good repeatability out of a gas sample valve, is making sure that pressure is the same every time. So you can see here I've highlighted, and, and will continue to do so throughout the presentation, um, the areas that we're, we're concerned with here. Here we're filling the, the gas sample valve with uh, sample. We have a carrier gas sweeping through the valve as well through ports five and four here out to an inlet or a column or another valve even. And uh, when we're ready to inject, we stop flow on the sample. And then I've drawn this valve in the on position, so I've denoted that it is on uh, so that I know I'm, I'm, I'm breaking one of my own rules here to show you that uh, what the valve looks like when it's in the on position. So we're switching the valve on. The carrier gas is now flowing into the valve, and instead of bypassing the loop, it's actually flowing through the loop and pushing sample out of the loop 
onto the inlet or the column, and that's how a gas sample valve works. Uh, it's pretty simple uh, valve design. So let's move along now to the six-port column isolation valve. Um, this is a valve that's used when you need to isolate a column. So here you can see we have a, a six-port valve. We've got a column here attached to the valve, and we have a restrictor here. When you see this valve design, you see an isolation valve, um, and you see a emulsive column on it. Nine times out of ten, you won't even need to know that what this column is. You're going to know it's almost always emulsive when you see uh, this six-port bypass valve configuration with a restrictor on it. I Honestly, I can't even remember the last time I saw an application that had this valve on it that did not have a emulsive column attached to it. And so it's almost always associated with analyzing light gases. And the reason why is because um, the only column that will separate uh, hydrogen, helium, oxygen, nitrogen, CO, uh, methane, uh, baseline resolution at ambient temperature uh, is the uh, emulsive column. And so it becomes really important in, in certain types of analyses, like um, in some natural gas analysis and some refinery gas analysis, lots of process and reactor study gases. They're, they're doing a lot of uh, light gas analysis. And so this column uh, becomes important because it's the only column that can separate those components. The downside to it is it has such resolving uh, resolution power that any components, CO2 and heavier, that go onto this column will, in essence, be almost irreversibly absorbed. So they will retain those components at such a high level that you, you won't be able to uh, analyze them or get them off this column in any, any short time frame. Uh, so it's important that we have a method that where we can bypass that column uh, to allow those heavier components to flow past it. So how does it work? Um, here we have um, a carrier gas. You can imagine allowing some light gases like helium, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, CO, um, methane uh, to flow on this column. And then before CO2 elutes onto the column, um, you could switch the valve and then flow uh, CO2 or any heavier uh, gas components around and bypass the valve. Now remember, now uh, once you switch the valve to the on position, this column is in a closed circuit, so it has no flow to it. So you will get linear, uh, uh, linear diffusion across the valve. So you can't hold components on there for a long period of time, but over chromatography time, uh, it should be fine. And then you can desorb them later, or you can allow them to flow off um, after the, the CO2 goes past the the valve, you should have a gap in your, your chromatography there. It's also important to know when using bypass valves, regardless of what the column is here, and this, this becomes important over a lot of valves, is to consider what the restriction is across the valve um, and what, that, what the effect is of that restriction on the, chrom, on the chromatography upstream and downstream of the valve that's causing the restriction. So you can see here we have um, carrier gas flowing into port 5 and out port 4 and across this, uh, this column here, column X. And this column has a specific uh, pressure restriction to it. Uh, it's, it's just a restriction that happens due to the dimensions of the column and the, pa the packing materials are, are um, you know, the type of column you're using even different columns will have different dimensions and different packings and different restrictions associated with them. So at a pressure uh, that's driving the flow, let's say pressure X, um, across this column, you will get a certain flow rate. We'll just call that flow rate Y. It doesn't matter what it is at this point. So at a pressure X across this restriction, we'll get a flow rate Y. Now when we switch the valve over here, to the uh, bypass position, the on position, if we have that same pressure X and we have no restriction here, 
then all of a sudden we're going to see our flow up and downstream of this valve increase to a higher rate. Reason why is because we would have no restriction here. So we need to make sure that we have a restriction here and that it's equal to the column restriction. And so I've drawn in a variable restrictor here. It could be a fixed restrictor. We do that often. We'll, we'll size a restrictor, a piece of open fuse silica tubing, to match the, the restriction uh, of this column. And what you do is just turn the, uh, the valve to the off position and apply a pressure, uh, a constant pressure to the column and measure the flow rate at the outlet of the detector or, or, down, or just downstream of the valve here to see what that flow rate is. And then you turn the valve back on and you measure the flow rate again you are going to notice that that flow rate is different than what you measured when the valve was in the off position. So then you go in, you adjust that restrictor until the flows match. Now when the flows are matching, it doesn't matter what position the valve is in, the flow is always the same across the, uh, the system. Uh, so that's going to allow you to, to have more predictable and better chromatography because the last thing you want is, is the flow rate on your instrument to be changing without you knowing it or, or have it dependent on the valve position. So that's how six port column bypass valve works. And those are some of the things that you need to be mindful of uh, when you're thinking of them, when you're thinking of it. So hopefully the next time you see one of these valves, you'll go, oh, I know exactly what that is. It's a six port bypass valve. It's, I guarantee you, it's all, almost guaranteed it's got a emulsive column on it, and you need to make sure that you're mindful of the flow balance across the valve. Those are the things you need to think about when you look at valves. What, what kind of valve is it? What's it doing? And what are the, the issues that I need to be mindful about when using this valve? So moving along now, we have a six-port uh, sequence reversal with uh, pre-column back flush valve. Uh, it's starting to get a little wordy here. But what this valve does, you'll see that it has two columns on it. We have carrier gas coming in the valve, uh, into the valve, it's flowing through column one, and it comes back around back into the valve and then flows through column two and out to the detector or another valve or a column. And this is one of the one of my favorite valves. I just find this valve, this design, fascinating. Um, and, and I'll show you why here in a minute. But um, anyway, this valve allows column one to switch positions with column two relative to each other. Um, and it operates as a back flush. So usually when you see this valve design, there's typically an alumina plot or a, or a gas pro column. And um, these are columns that are very good at, at analyzing uh, light hydrocarbons up through about C6 to C8. After that, they become too retentive and the analysis time becomes too long. And not everyone really needs to know uh, exactly, you know, what's resolved out past those C6, C8 levels. But they might be interested in uh, the amount of those hydrocarbons in the system, they just don't need to see how, uh, see the resolution. So this valve gives you the ability to screen um, the heavier hydrocarbons off on a pre-column, and then I'll allow the lighter, you know, this would be probably a DB1, uh, a short DB1 column, and I'll allow the lighter molecules to flow through, uh, we'll just say C1 to C5, uh, or C6 right now to flow through to column two for, for full resolution. If this was an alumina plot column, then we would have uh, good resolution on C4, C5 olefins, and that's probably the best column for doing C4, C5 olefin analysis. But the alumina plot doesn't handle the, the heavier hydrocarbons very well, so we would catch those heavier hydrocarbons up here on this column one. So if you look more closely at the, the flow considerations of the valve, you'll see how carrier gas flows into the valve and flows through port five and out port four here. And we have forward port flow across column one. The flow comes around back into port one and out port six. Uh, 
we have forward flow across column two. So in this case, our, our light hydrocarbons would flow through this short DB1 because it just doesn't have enough uh, theoretical plates to hold them up. And the, um, the heavier hydrocarbons would hang back onto this column and slowly start to make their way down this column. Before they get off the column and onto column two, then, whoops, sorry, then we can switch the valve to the um, on position. And when the valve is in the on position, something interesting happens. So if you go back and you look at uh, the valve in the off position, column one is the first column that the gas is flowing through, and column two is the second column uh, that in, in the series. When you go to the on position, now the columns have swapped positions. Now column two is the first column. Uh, it's column two is upstream of column one. So they've switched positions. We still have forward flow on column two, but column one is now back flushing. So not only have we switched their positions, but we flip-flopped column one around to the opposite direction. So now when you follow the carrier gas through, you can see that those C1 through C6 um, hydrocarbons are still resolving on the alumina plot. Um, and they're starting to come off. They're flowing through ports two and one. They're going up through column one now in the reverse direction. As they start to make their way on to this column one, all of the C6 plus components have then made, they're stuck on the front of this column. They then get back flushed as a single peak um, off the detector. So your first peak off of this analysis would be a C6 plus peak. And then you would see uh, C1 through C6 start to resolve off of the aluminum plot they're not affected much by this short DB1. They flow right through it out to the detector. So you can see here how we can take a valve and we can use a particular design to uh, screen off heavier hydrocarbons and then back flush them uh, to, the, to the detector. This is commonly used in uh, refinery gas applications um, it's used in natural gas where they want to get a BTU calculation, so they need to know uh, roughly what the amount of heavy hydrocarbons are in the system, but they don't necessarily need to resolve uh, the C6 plus components. They just want to know the amount that's there. So any questions so far on those uh, six port valves? We can take a little bit of a, a break here and, and see if there's any questions popping up. Yeah, absolutely. So again, you can ask questions over the chat box or you can ask them over the Q&A box, preferably the Q&A box and all of the panel can see those questions. And if you um, have dialed in over the phone line, you can also press star one and our operator, Cecilia, will open your line. And just uh, so you know, Shannon, I had a couple of people comment saying hello so far. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> definitely, yeah, but hold on, I've got more coming in here, just to give it a same. Okay, so are the same style of valves used in the Headspace auto sampler? Yes, so um, there's, there's a couple of different types of valves in the Headspace system. Um, there's, uh, there's some valves that aren't rotary valves, but the, the rotary valves that are used are, are the same as these, they're Valco valves. Um, I would have to look at the diagram. I can't remember off the top of my head exactly how it's configured, but the, the headspace system does have a uh, six-port gas sample valve in it. It does. Okay. Cecilia, let's check those phone lines. No questions over the phone at this time. Okay. Okay. All right, Shannon, back to you. All right. You. So we'll keep going and hopefully you're still awake because if you're not asleep by now, you might be by the end of the 10 port section. Um, here we go with the 10 port valve. So you see that uh, we have a blank 10 port valve. And one of the things I always notice is when you move up to 10 ports, things get significantly more complicated. Every time you add two ports to a valve, uh, the number of possibilities uh, just explodes with, with what you can do with it. Um, so you can see here, we're going to talk about 
focus on uh, one ten port valve here. This is a um, this is a ten port gas sample valve that's also got back flush to vent um, functionality to it. So in essence, it's doing two things at once. And we'll talk in detail about how this valve works. Now, if you want a good homework question, um, you can look at this valve here. This second valve is also a 10-port gas sample valve back flush to vent. It actually does exactly the same thing as this valve, but it handles things a little differently, and flow considerations are taking into account more closely with this valve here. So if you look at this valve and you look at this valve, you can, you can ask yourself, well, which valve would I want to use and why? I'm talking about this one today because it's the simplest of the two um, uh, for, for example purposes. Um, there's also some other valves here. We have a 10 port. You'll see now that we have 10 ports, we have enough room on this valve to have two gas sample loops. So these loops are when the valve's in the off position in parallel. So we can load these loops with two different samples. This becomes a really good valve if you have an analysis where you want to load sample and you want to load an internal standard at the same time. Um, you can see here that we can fill this the second loop here with a sample, and the sample will go out to its own vent, and you can uh, fill this uh, first loop here with internal standard. When you inject the valve, both valves get swept by the same carrier gas, and both get and both loops get injected to the same channel. So you inject both samples together. So you're injecting two different samples to the same inlet. This valve does something very similar, only it's taking the same sample in two loops and injecting them on uh, two different channels or two different inlets. This is a valve we use very often at Agilent, where if you have a case where you're designing an instrument and you need two six-port gas sample valves to inject the same sample onto two different inlets or to two different valves or to two different columns, however your system is designed, this is a valve that you can consolidate those two six-port gas sample valves into into just one 10-port dual-loop gas sample valve. So in this case, we have one sample coming into the valve, and if you follow the flow path here, it fills both loops. And then if you look here, when the sample's injected, each one of these loops fill, uh, gets injected to these two different columns or to, these, or to two different inlets uh, separately. So this one, the loops are in series when the valve is off, and this one, the loops are in parallel when the valves are off. This is another 10-port valve design that uh, I've had a lot of interest in over the years. Um, a lot of times customers, customers will come to me and they say, oh, I have a GC where I'm having to swap columns out a lot, uh, have an inlet to detector, and I've just got a single column. Uh, that I'm doing analysis on. And every now and then, uh, someone in another group who is also using this GC wants to come in and install a second column and do an analysis and then leave. But we don't want to have to unplug the columns every time. You can use this 10-port um, uh, column selection design to handle that for you. So if you look at this design, uh, it requires two flow sources, so you'd have to have an aux controller. You'd have your inlet hooked up to um, one of the columns. So let's say our inlet is hooked up to this, this inlet here on the valve. If you follow it through, it flows through this column and then out to a detector. If you look at what the other aux flow is doing, it is uh, coming in this other inlet here, and it's back flushing this column uh, out to bend. So, in a column selection mode, you could select between two different columns on the same inlet and detector without having to uh, remove those columns from the instrument just by turning this valve on and off. 
the nice thing I like about it is, is when it's in one position or the other, one column is selected, the other column is being back flushed and cleaned up. So the other column is always ready to be used and conditioned uh, when it's time to put it in. You don't have to wait on the time to install or wait on the, the column to, to be baked out and cleaned up. It's always in the oven. It's always being heat cycled. You do have to uh, be mindful of the different temperature limitations of the columns. If you've got a column where you're running a method very hot and you have another column in the same oven that, that can't, that doesn't have a high enough max temperature rating to handle that temperature, then you could potentially uh, destroy a column uh, inadvertently. You have to make sure that the columns are temperature compatible with both methods that you'll be running. So that's a design we see a lot. So let's move forward and talk about this. This is the uh, pinport gas sample valve with pre-column backflush to vent. It can be ordered as a G3440B option 801. Um, we'll stall it on the instrument for you. It'll come plumbed up just like this on your instrument. And it's a way to uh, do a couple of things. You're, you're starting to see a common theme here with rotary valves. Oh, look, it's got a gas sample loop on it, so we know it's a gas sample valve. Oh, look, it's got an, another aux flow zone, and we can tell just by glancing here that this this column is being uh, back flushed to vent. So we know immediately by looking at this design that this is going to be some pre-screening column that um, we're using in the application. If we're screening components, we're probably screening the heavier molecules. And so we're allowing some lighter components to flow through this, this column too to a detector. Um, or to another valve. And so we see that just by looking at these valves, you can immediately recognize the function of them, and you really don't have to pay it that much attention to, um, you know, all the little details of trying to figure out what the valve is doing every time. Just by glancing at these different functional pieces that are hanging off the valve, you can immediately recognize what the valve is, what it's doing, and you can probably make a really good educated guess about what the columns are. Nine times out of ten, this valve design is used with permanent gas type applications, and it always has a pre-screening column here that's some sort of HACEP porous polymer column. It could be a Q or a HACEP A or a HACEP T of some sort, um, or some other column that, that's, that would work well uh, for screening the molecules of, of interest. And this column two is um, either another variant of that column if we're allowing uh, lighter, uh, we're wanting to get some separation between some mid-range or, or light to mid-range hydrocarbons, or this could be a emulsive. Um, if you look at this valve and you see that a emulsive is on this column two position here, you will know what the analysis is. It's always either a hydrogen or helium analysis. You could also be looking at oxygen or nitrogen. But you know that a emulsive column, you can't allow CO2 or anything heavier uh, to go on that column. So you would know that you would be back flushing them. There's no bypass on it. The only other option is, is, is to bypass those lighter components. So you know if you see a emulsive here, you're probably doing a hydrogen analysis nine times out of ten. You could be doing an oxygen or nitrogen analysis. Uh, but you know that all the heavier components, including CO2, are being back flushed because we can't allow them to go on that emulsive. So now you know just by looking at this what it's doing. You don't, you don't really need to think about much more. You may ask yourself, though, well, how did someone uh, come to uh, the 10 port design? And I was thinking about this one day, and I, I, I think what happened is, is is somebody had, a you know, two six-ports, and you can see here we have a six-port gas sample valve, and you have a six-port backflush to vent valve, and they noticed that there's some commonality between these two valves in the, the, in, the gas inlet ports. So you have a, a 
gas flowing in to port two here and out port one. Then it flows over to this other six port valve, flows into port two prime, I've labeled it, and one prime and out to the detector. So these ports are really doing the same thing. And as long as the valve is in the same, these two valves are in the same state at all times, then we could combine them. Here we have two six port valves and we have 12 ports. Um, if we eliminate the common port, two of the common ports, then we go down to 10 ports. And if we keep the design the same, you can see here I have gas flowing in port two and out port one and over to the column or the detector. And in essence, that's what I'm doing here. Gas is flowing in port two and out port one to a column and a detector. We maintain the gas sample uh, functionality of the 10 port valve. You can see three, four, five, and six are the same as three, four, five, and six on the 10 port valve here. So we've maintained that functionality. And we've stolen the back flush to vent functionality from this six port valve and place it in the same position, seven, eight, nine, and 10 on this 10 port valve. So you can see here, we've maintained all of the functionality as long as all we need is the same on off state of these two valves into one. And you just saved yourself a lot of money by only buying one valve, one actuator, and uh, one heated zone on the GC. So um, it's important to think about these things uh, from a monetary standpoint as well as maintenance standpoint over time and also um, ease of application uh, setup. So let's talk a little bit more about how the, the back pre-column back flush to vent works. You can see in the off position we got two things going on where we could be loading sample. Um, through the gas sample loop, and we're back flushing column one. So if there are any hydrocarbons on column one, um, or any other components for that matter, uh, when the valve is in the opposition, they will always be back flushed to vent. And so when we're ready to do our next analysis, our column one column, which is our, our cleanup column, so to speak, to, to, to scrub the heavier uh, molecules, uh, will be ready for its its function, its chromatography function when the valve's on. PCM1 uh, is providing flow to uh, column two and, and to the detector. So when the valve is switched on, um, now the sample is bypassing the loop. The uh, flow module is providing flow to the valve and it's sweeping the sample from the loop and all of our analytes are going on to column one in a forward direction, flowing through column one into the valve and into column two where more separations are happening. Once we've got the analytes of interest onto column two, like I said before, usually light gases, um, we're going to switch this valve back to the opposition and go back into sample load and uh, column one cleanup mode, or we're back flushing the vent here and analytes are flowing off, further resolving off through the chromatography system here to the detector. So that's how a pre-column back flush to vent valve works. And now with that knowledge, you can look at uh, a diagram and go, oh, I, I can start to see in my mind now what's going on with uh, this more complex design. You look at this design and you look at each one of these valves and you immediately start to recognize what they're doing based on the information I just gave you. And you'll see these common themes throughout all valve chromatography. And so even though this looks complicated, you'll notice that, oh, there's really only four valves uh, being used in this system. Um, we know immediately just by looking at it that two of them are gas sample valves. We know this is a six port and it's only got a loop on it. So it's a six port gas sample valve. It's just being used to inject sample. That's all it's doing. And we have this, we have two of these 10 port gas sample valves, which we already talked about. This is the one we just discussed, the pre-column backflushed event. And oh, this is a um, 
uh, a six port bypass valve and we know that these valves always almost always have an alum or a emulsive column on them so this is this is being used to resolve permanent gases and uh, this valve here is usually got an alumina plot and a DV1 on it uh, and it's being used to do a C6 plus or C8 plus backflush so you know about all these valves already so you know exactly what the system's doing now one of the other uh, things I typically look at is how the sample loops are are configured so if we just kind of focus in on uh, one of the sample loop what the GC sample loops here you can see that immediately we have three gas sample valves in this application and we have all of the sample loops are connected. So if you follow the sample flow through the valves, you see that each loop is being filled by the same sample. So you can see here that, that the same sample is flowing through all of the valves, so all of the loops are connected in series. So we know we're only analyzing one sample here. It's just that up on injection, we're breaking those, those analyses out into three parts to accomplish uh, some chromatography that we couldn't do on a single column. So, as I think I mentioned before, when you when you read diagrams, try to focus on one thing. When you're if if the diagram's really complicated, and it, I know it's when you see the diagram and it's it's got all the lines on the and the valves on the page, it's it's easy to look at the middle of the diagram and kind of just get lost in it. What you need to do is start. Pick, pick a flow source and follow that flow source through the system and that'll help you isolate what's going on. This is how the gases flow through the instrument. They flow from left to right when you're looking at the, the actual instrument and they flow from left to right on the diagram as well. They flow from the flow source that's providing the pressure to drive the flow through the system to the detector. So if you follow this channel one here, you can see that it flows through uh, this valve, this gas sample, this 10 port gas sample valve flows through the column and off to a TCD detector. This so happens that this is a MOLSIV column connected to this, G, to this valve here. This is a HACEP column. It's, it's screening everything heavier than uh, oxygen and nitrogen and back flushing at the vent. And we're analyzing uh, hydrogen in uh, refinery gas on this column uh, and we're using an argon carrier but by just by looking at this valve configuration like I told you before it's just a 10 port gas sample backflush to vent valve if you see that it's got a emulsive on it and there's no downstream valves or other columns you know that it's doing a hydrogen and helium analysis, especially if you see argon carrier or nitrogen carrier gas, and it's going to this TCD, and, and sure enough, there's a small chromatogram. We can see one single hydrogen peak in this analysis. Let's move on to the second channel, and if you follow the, the flow diagram from left to right, start with the flow source, flow up through the valve, and we can see that this gas sample, uh, 10 port gas sample backflush to vent valve also has HACEPs on it. When samples injected, it goes through both HACEPs. There's not a mole sieve here, but it flows through to a six port bypass valve that we talked about. This six port bypass valve does have a mole sieve on it. We're using helium carrier gas on this channel and um, we're using this mole sieve to resolve oxygen, nitrogen, CO, and methane, and we're allowing uh, CO2 and C1 to C2 hydrocarbons to bypass this uh, mole sieve, flow around to the TCD, and um, then we're analyzing the, the lighter gases, and you can see a small chromatogram. I'll show a bigger one here in a minute. Um, and so this is also part of the permanent gas analysis channel of this refinery gas system. But just by looking at these common valve um, 
combinations and recognizing what each channel is doing, you can immediately start to piece together what the application is, and it and then it's not as intimidating as trying to trying to figure thing out, figure the the system out in, in such a detailed manner. So if we go over to uh, the third channel, we can flow through this this system. We see we go through the six port gas sample valve. That's being injected into a split inlet, uh, which allows us to um, split the sample, control the, the amount of sample going onto the, the GC column. And we're flowing into a six-port series reversal valve. And I told you before that these valves are almost always used in uh, C6 plus back flush considerations with uh, aluminum plot columns. And that's exactly what this is. Uh, we're doing a, a C1 to C6 analysis with a C6 plus backflush to an FID. We're just analyzing hydrocarbons. So if you look here um, and you look at this analysis, that's actually what you see. The first peak is on the FID channel, a C6 plus peak. Then we get our C4, C5 uh, olefin resolution off of, uh, of that channel off the alumina plot. But this, you know now that how this works. The C6 plus got hung up on that first DB1 column on that sequence reversal valve. We then flipped their positions and, and flipped the, the, the DB1 so that it was flowing backwards. We back flushed the C6 plus off first, and then all the other components come through it off the alumina plot uh, to, the F, to the FID, fully resolved. If you look at the 10-port gas sample valve back flush to vent in series with a six-port bypass valve on this TCD channel, you see that your first peak is CO2. Now you might wonder, well, CO2 is the largest molecule in this group of molecules. Why on earth is it coming off first? Because we allowed these lighter oxygen, nitrogen, methane, CO to flow off of those first two columns on that 10-port valve onto the mole sieve where we trapped them in on the bypass valve when we turned it on. We allowed CO2 to flow around um, these components, elute first, then we turned the valve back to the off position and eluted uh, oxygen, nitrogen, methane, and CO, and that allowed us to prevent CO2 from going on to uh, the mole sieve, and we back flushed any components heavier than that. So if you were to look at this diagram, or if you were to look at these chromatograms, and you were to go, oh, CO2 came off first, and then I have a permanent gas, you don't even have to think about it. You know that's a 10-port gas sample back, back flushed event in series with a 6-port bypass valve. So when you see it on the diagram, you know what the, you know that the chromatogram is going to look like this, and vice versa. So think about it in terms of of function giving a certain chromatographic result, and have a picture in your mind of what the valve design is that, that accomplishes that. Then when you look at the diagram, you don't have to think as hard about it because you know what it's doing. So here we have a, a ten port gas sample valve where the mole sieve is on the 10 port valve, we're back flushing everything heavier than helium and hydrogen, and we're just doing a hydrogen analysis. So hopefully I was able to give you some tools um, that you can use in the future for better understanding valves. I'll be happy to hang on here and answer any questions that you have, uh, if you have any, and uh, feel free to send me an email as well if, if, if you want to. All right, thank you, Shannon, for your very informative presentation. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please, please do so now, and just click the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. And if, let's just see if we have any questions. Okay. Um, it looks like 
We are coming close to an end today. Um, there's no questions at this moment, but if you would like to submit a question, um, the, all the questions will be addressed by your speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. Um, this, and let me just double check, there's no questions. Sounds great. Thank you so much for your participation today. And thank you again, Shannon, for your wonderful presentation. And this webcast can be viewed on demand through November 2021. And until next time, thank you and have a great day.